How blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. This man will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields fruit in its season, its leaf does not wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. These first three verses of the first psalm serve in many ways as an introduction to all of the psalms, and they give us at least one of the primary purposes of this collection of 150 poems, songs that we have in our Bibles, which is that they are for us to meditate on. You can imagine, perhaps, the original Israelites receiving the law of God, but not having each of them in their own home, in the way we do, the complete law for them to read and to talk about. But they were given these songs throughout their history, and as we know, songs are much easier to internalize and to memorize and to repeat to ourselves. And so, these psalms, these poems were to be meditated on. And the word meditate here in Psalm 1 is not perhaps what we think of. We think of meditation as clearing your mind and emptying your thoughts. Uh, But meditation in Psalm 1 is something closer to murmuring, to saying these words to yourself over and over again so that these words can sink deeply into the heart, into the mind. And as John Albert mentioned around the Lord's table this morning, The Psalms also have an emotional aspect to as we repeat them to ourselves, as we meditate on them, they resonate with us and the various emotions that we feel as we strive to serve God in a difficult world. This is the practice that I want us to engage in this morning, the meditation on the psalm, specifically Psalm 40, where Alex read for us at the beginning of our worship together. And I hope that you will have your Bible open and in front of you. There's actually going to be nothing on the screen this morning, and so I will encourage you all the more to have your Bible in front of you as we think through Psalm 40 together. And not just Psalm 40, but it just so happens, this is not usually the case, it just so happens that there are uh, one or two Psalms around Psalm 40 that have a similar theme, that use similar language. And we want to tie in those thoughts as well, but we will be primarily looking at Psalm 40. Thank you for being here. It is a uh, holiday weekend still, I guess, so we surely have people gone. We have people visiting here, and uh, as has already been said multiple times, however it is and whyever it is that you are joining us this morning, we appreciate it. We pray for you and, and that this service would be an encouragement to you. Psalm 40 begins in the style of the Psalms of Thanksgiving, which, if you remember, some things we've said about that before mean that the psalmist is praising God for what God has done for him. I waited patiently for the Lord, he says, as he opens the psalm. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon a rock making my footsteps firm. The psalmist describes being brought up out of a muddy pit. I don't know what image you want to put in your mind for that. Maybe you think of a time you got your vehicle stuck uh, in a pit or in a ditch, or maybe you think about a biblical image like Jeremiah being thrown down in that muddy cistern and having to sit down there in the gross, nasty, uh, dark well until someone would rescue him. This is the place the psalmist was when he cried out to God. He was in the pit. There's indications later in the psalm that this pit was a time of distress and anguish brought about by his own sin. Do you remember that pit? Maybe maybe you're in that pit right now. Remember what that's like. Being in despair, being in agony because of the guilt of our 
sin and feeling nothing but hopelessness and despair because of our own rebellion against God. This is actually one of the themes that runs through this group of psalms that Psalm 40 is in. And Psalm 38, just maybe a page or two earlier, gives, I think, a, a longer and uh, in some ways much more vivid, painful description of this pit of sin that we are familiar with. Let's read a little bit out of Psalm 38 to get a picture of this situation. Uh, Psalm 38, beginning in verse 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in your wrath, and chasten me not in your burning anger. For your arrows have sunk deep into me, and your hand has pressed down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For my iniquities are gone over my head. As a heavy burden, they weigh too much for me. My wounds grow foul and fester because of my folly. I am bent over and greatly bowed down. I go mourning all day long for my loins are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am numbed and badly crushed. I groan because of the agitation of my heart. Does that sound familiar to us? We know what that's like when we stand guilty before God and we can think of nothing else. It, it pierces us deeply into our innermost being. And we are weak from the inside. Our bones are failing. Our heart is crushed. And we are weighed down by this burden. We are haunted by this monster all day long. And nothing in life is good because we are so burdened, so infected by our sin and the guilt that we have as we stand before a holy God. Thanks be to God who has delivered us from this horrible pit as described in Psalm 40. And so in Psalm 40, going into verse 3, now being saved, delivered from this horrible place, he says, God has put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. This is the first thing that the psalmist learns from being delivered from the pit, which is that we have to trust in God. That's the only way out. And he hopes that others will see his deliverance and learn that the only way out of the pit is to trust in God. And so verse four, he says, how blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders which you have done, and your thoughts toward us. There is none to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. To trust in God is to look to Him, to not look to ourselves. That's think what's being described in these verses, is that there are those that cause problems for themselves and then try to fix them themselves. There are those maybe that cause problems for themselves and then look to other sources of aid or of rescue. How blessed is the man who makes Jehovah his trust. And the psalmist praises God for the many wonders. In his deliverance from the pit, he has seen the fact that God is always working for his people. God is always thinking of his people. And so only by trusting in him can we be delivered. And if we go back to Psalm 38, where we read about that man who was sick and burdened and crushed and wounds festering in his own iniquity. We go back to Psalm 38 and we continue reading in verse 9. Notice in his pain and in his anguish how the psalmist has nowhere to go but to God. And he pours everything out to God and to God alone. Psalm 38 verse 9. Lord, all my desire is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs. My strength fails me. And the light of my eyes, even that has gone from me. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague. My kinsmen stand afar off. Those who seek my life lay snares for me. And those who seek to injure me have threatened destruction and they devise treachery all day long. But I 
like a deaf man do not hear. I am like a mute man who does not open his mouth. Yes, I am like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth there are no arguments. For I hope in you, O Lord, you will answer, O Lord, my God. For I said, may they not rejoice over me who, when my foot slips, would magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to fall and my sorrow is continually before me. For I confess my iniquity, I am full of anxiety because of my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and strong, and many are those who hate me wrongfully. Those who repay evil for good, they oppose me because I follow what is good. Do not forsake me, O Lord, O my God, do not be far. Confess my iniquity, I'm full of anxiety. This is what it means to trust in God. When we're in the pit, when we're burdened by our own sin, when that is gnawing at us and piercing us from the inside and, 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 and creating this overwhelming darkness in our life, we must confess our sin to God. Yes, he knows it, but only when we unload all of that before him and tell him, Lord, I have sinned in this way. I have done this. My heart has been full of this. When we open ourselves up to God and confess our sins to him, he hears us, he answers us, and then we put it in his hands to heal us and to fix us and not lean on ourselves. Or as Peter would say in 1 Peter 5 verses 6 and 7, humble yourselves before the mighty hand of God and at the proper time he will exalt you, casting all your anxieties upon him. Because he cares for you. And so going back to Psalm 40, the psalmist recognizes after seeing the deliverance, he knows God cares for his people. And so we trust in him, he will deliver us. But the psalmist learns something else from his experience in the pit. Notice Psalm 40, 6 through 8. Sacrifice, the psalmist says, sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Being delivered from the pit, the psalmist has learned that God does not simply want sacrifices and offerings. He says, those things you have not desired, and then literally he says, but ears you have dug. What in the world does that mean? Well, it could mean a couple things, but most likely it means that God has opened his ears to be able to listen to God and to obey what he has to say. That's what God really wants people who will listen. And that seems to continue in verse 7 when the psalmist says, behold, I come in the scroll of the book, it is written of me. There's this moment where the psalmist realizes that all of God's teaching, all of God's commands, his instruction, it's not just something that's written and is out there. It's written about me, that his word is for me. And God has spoken it for everyone, but that includes myself. And so his words must come into my heart and must come into my ears that are, I would receive them. And I would in verse eight, take that law within my heart and delight to do his will. This is what God wants. Think about that experience in the pit. And how many times do we find ourselves in that guilt? And we think that just going to church on Sunday and we come in maybe feeling that burden, and yet we go through the worship, we sing, we take the Lord's Supper, we maybe hear a sermon that pricks our heart, steps on our toes to some degree, and we leave feeling like, okay, I've appeased God, maybe more so we've just appeased our own guilty conscience, and then we're back into our own lives, we're back into sin, we're back into the pit, and God doesn't want that. The purpose of the sacrifices and the offerings of the Old Testament, even then we're not for the purpose of just living in wickedness and then going and appeasing God with an offering every once in a while. 
The psalmist says, no, what God wants is people who will have open ears to listen to him and to obey him and to delight, to want to do the things that God tells his people to do. So the psalmist is transformed, not only in his actions, but also in his words. He says in verse 9, I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips, O Lord. You know I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. You, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me and your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. This is good news. You see that that's the phrase. I, I think, uh, depending on your translation, and you may literally have in verse 9, I have proclaimed good news, glad tidings of the deliverance that God gives. And you see the, 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 the nature, this reciprocal nature here, where in verse 11, the psalmist says, God has not withheld, he has not restrained he has not kept back his compassion. Compassion is always flowing, always given toward his people. And so verse 9 and 10, the psalmist says, I will not hold back my praise for God. Delivered from the pit, learns to trust in God, learns to listen to God and do his will, and then tells everybody he knows about the deliverance that God has worked for him to speak of God's righteousness, of God's faithfulness, of God's loving kindness, and of God's truth. But we keep going and we see that there really is in many ways still a problem. The rest of the psalm indicates that, that this pit and this distress and this despair is not just something of the past but seems to be haunting the psalmist in the present as well. Verse 12, evils beyond number have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to see. They are more numerous than the hairs of my head and my heart has failed me. It's hard to know exactly what's going on here. Maybe this is just a description. Remember we've said in poetry before, things are not always in chronological order. Maybe this is just the description of where he used to be of the iniquities that are, that are greater than what he can even count. But it could also be the case that the psalmist has been delivered from the pit, but he's not all the way there yet. He continues to wrestle. He continues to struggle either with the consequences of his own sin or the perpetual wrestling against sin. I think we know what that is like. And so after praising God for the deliverance, he goes back to God, knowing that God's the only source of rescue. And so he prays to God in verse 13, be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Make haste, O Lord, to help me. Let those be ashamed and humiliated together who seek my life to destroy it. Let those be turned back and dishonored who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha. But verse 16, let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. Since I am afflicted and needy, let the Lord be mindful of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. In his prayer, as we partook of the cup this morning, drew a uh, voice for all of us. The struggle that we have was every week, it seems like, we remember the Lord's Supper, we remember his death, and we remember our own brokenness. The brokenness that we've come out of, the brokenness that we're dealing with now, and we know that we'll continue to face our own brokenness and our own sin and our own failure. And so Psalm 40, in some ways, paints this picture of an ongoing struggle, an ongoing dependence on God. He's the one that's brought us up out of the pit. And so now as we face the reality of our own sin in the present, we look to him. We call out to him. And verse 16, even in the midst of our struggle against sin, we can rejoice. Because we're seeking God 
We love him and we're seeking to magnify his name. It's so easy as we deal with sin, as we find ourselves in the pit or maybe back in the pit. It's so easy to focus on us and ourselves, to wallow in our own self-pity. I am this way. I am this way. I can never do this. I'm just this. The psalmist says in verse 16 that those who love God's salvation will say, the Lord be magnified. And so if I'm and when I am struggling with sin, I recognize with the final words of Psalm 40, I am afflicted and needy. I'm nothing. God be magnified. He will be mindful of me. He will be my help and my deliverer. And I turn to him. I confess to him and I trust in him. This is uh, also the key theme that is sounded in Psalm 39, the psalm in between, these two that we've looked at so far. And we'll just read this and notice the Ecclesiastes-like descriptions of man's existence and how the emphasis of this psalm is on the fact that man is nothing, that I am nothing, and so I have no hope but in the Lord. Psalm 39, I said, I will guard my ways that I might not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I refrained even from good and my sorrow grew worse. My heart was hot within me while I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Lord, make me to know my end and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. Behold, you have made my days as a hand breath. My lifetime has nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely they make an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I have become mute. I do not open my mouth because it is you who have done it. Remove your plague from me. Because of the opposition of your hand, I am perishing. With reproofs, you chasten a man for iniquity. You consume as a moth what is precious to him. Surely every man is a mere breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner like all my fathers. Turn your gaze away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. It may seem odd to us that this Psalm 39 is supposed to comfort us and make us feel better about our desperate situation. Because so much of the Psalm is about the fact that I'm, I'm nothing but a breath. And I stand guilty before God, and if God just keeps his gaze on me, I think meaning his wrath, then I'm done for. I'm nothing but a broken, transient man with nothing to show for my life, but a few meager possessions that will go on to somebody else. How is this a comfort to us? Well, it's because only when we recognize our own smallness, our own brokenness, only when we recognize how nothing we are and how all of our dependence is on God, that the very breath that we breathe is given to us by him and he could take it away in a moment. And when we recognize that we are guilty before him and he has every right to give us what we deserve, which is death now and forever, when we realize that, then we can accept God's chastening, we can accept his discipline, and we can say with the psalmist in 39.7, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. And that seems to be the message of Psalm 40 as well. How blessed is the man who made the Lord his trust. God is the one that rescues us from the pit, and as we continue to face the reality of our own sin, our only chance, our only hope is to cry out to God, to confess our sins to him, and to say, let the Lord be mindful of me. 
But how can we have confidence if we are so weak, if we are so broken, if there is so much heartache in our wrestling against sin? How in the world are we ever supposed to have confidence in this forgiveness or in this salvation or in this hope? And remember that the psalmist over and over again, when he asks that question, speaks really only of God and what God has done. As in verse 5, many are the wonders which you have done and your thoughts towards us. God is the one that is working to accomplish this for his people, and so we trust in him. And the greatest evidence, the greatest demonstration of God's wonders towards his people Better yet, the greatest evidence of God thinking and planning for the good of his people was the plan that he had from before time to send his son to take on flesh, to take on a body, and to come and to be what the Old Testament sacrifices could not be, to do what no other person could do, and to give himself for the sins of his people. And so listen to the words of the writer of the book of Hebrews in chapter 10 and see if something here sounds familiar. And speaking of the weaknesses of the system of sacrifices in the law of Moses, the Hebrew writer says in the first 10 verses of chapter 10, For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise... Would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have consciousness of sins? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year after year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Let me just stop right here and ask us, does this, is this how we feel? Do we feel like no matter what, we just always have a reminder of our sin and we're stuck in that guilt and despair. If that's the case, I want us to see in Hebrews that, that the Hebrew writer is saying, that's, a, that's the old law. That's, the, that's a previous experience that is no longer applicable. Why? Verse 5 of Hebrews 10. Therefore, when he, that is Jesus, comes into the world, he says... Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, I have come. Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Psalm 40. And the Hebrew writer comments on that, saying, After saying above, sacrifices and offerings and whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have not desired, nor have you taken pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. By this will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus is the answer to Psalm 40. The struggle against sin, the coming up out of the pit, the facing again of our own iniquities. Can you imagine for the psalmist and for those maybe hearing for the first time Psalm 40, offering their sacrifices, atoning for sin, and yet it's year after year, the same sacrifice, the same offerings. And the Hebrew writer says, no more. Because Jesus... Jesus, by offering his body, and maybe you noticed that, that, the translation of Psalm 40 is just a little bit different as related in Hebrews 10. Instead of saying, ears you have dug, he says, a body you have prepared for me. I think they go together. The translation in Hebrews 10 indicates that, that now in the mouth of Jesus, he says, God, I have taken on flesh and this body belongs to you. And so everything that Jesus did, everything he said, everything he did in his life, every action, and then especially when he gave up that body to be nailed to a tree, to be killed on the cross, that body was his offering to listen to God and to do God's will as Jesus prayed in the garden, to offer his body. Now that Jesus has done that, 
the Hebrew writer says, we that trust in him have been sanctified through that offering once for all. And so when Psalm 40 says, I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips, O Lord, you know. Psalm 40 is a proclamation of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. That we can have confidence in the forgiveness of that we have in Jesus. So we no longer have to wrestle with our doubts about whether we are forgiven, but we can have confidence that through his sacrifice, we are sanctified once for all, and, and we can, and only in Jesus, by God's grace, we can fulfill the invitation of Jesus in Psalm 40 and say to God, my ears you have opened. I will listen to you. The Bible, the word of God has been written for me. I will hide it within my heart and I will delight to do your will. That I, like Jesus, will say, a body you have prepared for me. And so my relationship with God is not sacrifices and offerings to appease my guilty conscience. My relationship with God is offering myself to listen, and to obey. As Paul would say in Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ. And remember what we have done in our baptism. That as Hebrews describes that offering of Jesus' body, that we have imitated that, we have joined ourselves to that by being buried with him in baptism. So that we can say with Paul, I've been crucified with Christ, no longer I who live. Christ lives in me, and the life that I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In Jesus, the gospel of Psalm 40 has come true, that we can have forgiveness and transformation to come out of the pit, to walk on a firm place, to listen and to obey. That is is the gospel. And that is the hope that we have in Jesus. I want to end with the reading of this psalm and have that be the last thing that we do together. And so when the psalm is finished being read, I'll ask Steve to lead the song that he has selected. And the singing of that song provides us an opportunity to look at ourselves and to use Psalm 38, 39, and 40 as a mirror. Is our heart right with God? Are we in the pit trying to mask our sin and our despair by going through the motions of religious ritual? Or have we opened ourselves up to God? We told him everything. Have we confessed to him? Have we let him open our ears? Have we recognized our own weakness and trusted in him? Have we washed away our sins in baptism? Or do we need his help? or the help of the Christians here. Let's ask those questions. And as we sing that song, we are here to help you if you need that. But let's close with a reading of the gospel as presented in Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done and your thoughts toward us. There is none to compare with you, if I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. Sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. My ears you have opened. Burn offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me 
I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips, O Lord, you know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. You, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. For evils beyond number have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I am not able to see. They are more numerous than the hairs of my head, and my heart has failed me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Make haste, O Lord, to help me. Let those be ashamed and humiliated together who seek my life to destroy it. Let those be turned back and dishonored who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha. Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. I am afflicted and needy. Let the Lord be mindful of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O my God. 